Welcome to the Final Thoughts episode on Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the PlayStation Game Console. My name is Ed. My name's Joe. This is a game that I have not played. It's a game that Ed had not played before this, so I'm going to let Ed lead off with it. But sure. uh, before we get started, we the way that we do this is we go through the good, the bad, the terrible, and then we follow up with the great. Right. So we're going to start with the good. So what's okay. the first good thing that you want to say about the game? Okay. I mean, uh, there's plenty to say that's good. Uh, probably the two main things that, that I... Oh, wait, no. Actually, I only have one thing on my list. It was the map design. I think it's good. I agree. I that was on my list as well. Yeah. I, I think it's f squarely in the good category. Yeah, uh, which is surprising because this is an early Metroidvania. I mean, this is the first game that created the term Metroidvania. I'm not yeah. sure if the term was actually <laughs> even created until maybe a couple a release or two after this. Sure, but, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's in the Metroid style. Metroid came first, and then Kathleen Simply the Night sort of copied the, the open-world 2D platformer style. And um, But, yeah, again, for as early as this was in the genre, yes, the map design, I mm -hmm. agree, is yeah. pretty stellar. It's cohesive enough. I think it has uh, a few too many twists and turns uh, at points where it becomes a little bit difficult to parse on the map screen. Uh, and, I guess, again, this leads into the bad of not enough warps. Uh, but this is the thing that you can only say in 2021 with 24 years of hindsight. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, I, it's the game's 24 years old now, yeah. yeah. A lot of the, the quote-unquote bad or terrible things that I have to say are due to the fact that the game isn't that old. Sure. So, I mean, it, it's impossible to, to, you know, correctly analyze the game uh, in hindsight. Yeah, it's a product of its time. But Fair. we'll still we'll still make note of things that we find to yeah. be bad, even by modern game standard. I, I, I think I think the map was fine. It was gigantic, which I loved. Uh, and, of course, you know, the, the, the quote-unquote the twist that sort of everybody knows. And I had known about it, but... Having never seen it myself, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect, and it was uh, even more uh, liberating than I, I kind of thought. It kind of reminded me of uh, Dark Souls in a way. Uh, once you get past the halfway point in that game, things really open up to you. So it kind of reminded me of that. Uh, I think that's about, that's probably the only, like, squarely good thing. Everything else is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty malleable for me. I don't know, what about you? Do you have anything? Uh, I was going to say, yeah, the, the control is pretty solid. It's a market improvement oh, I was from... Gonna... <laughs> Well, yeah. okay. Yeah. When I, when I say solid, I mean it's a market improvement from the previous Castlevania games. Up until right. now, Castlevania had been a um, a linear single stage uh, single stage progression type of game, right. such as yeah, you know, up through um, Super Castlevania Four, Castlevania Bloodlines, and those were those were the newer Castlevania games. There's uh, Rondo of Blood, Dracula X. Is that for the Saturn? Uh, Dracula X was for Super Nintendo. Yeah. So those, I mean, but all those games, they still had the clunky jumping controls. Yeah. And they were still the same, similar kind of a clunky Castlevania style. Although Castlevania 4 did have the ability to somewhat change your trajectory after jumping, it was still, it was still, I would say, clunky control, especially compared to Symphony of the Night. So it was a marked improvement above the control of the previous game. But I would still say that the control is not... I wouldn't put it in the bad category. I would put it probably at worst in the neutral category. But it sounds like Ed may disagree with me as far as how the control goes. Besides yeah. besides one specific aspect of the control, which we are going to cover either soon or sooner or later yeah. in this review. Well, actually, I didn't even write that thing down, but I'm sure you must be talking about commands. And I am the, going to be doing that. Let's cover that later, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, again, it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to judge whether or not this was acceptable in the year 1997. Uh, but in the year 2020, 21, I would consider the controls to be bad bordering on terrible, I think. No, okay. Uh, and again, this this goes with the, the commands thing. The, the, the straight left and right and jump and attack, that's fine, but that's only four commands. Uh, anything that's more complex than that is is much more difficult to pull off than, than it should be. Yeah. Anything that's a command attack. Which, yeah, let's let's save that, though, for the terrible yeah, part. Yeah, so that, that was just mine. I actually hadn't written that down, but since you mentioned it, I just wanted to touch on that. I'll just say basic, the basic controls are good. I'm pressing up an attack to use your special attack, right? That's yeah. the classic uh, Castlevania trope, no, uh, classic Castlevania command in order to use your special attack. And that still works just fine in this. And yeah. the dagger attack also is really satisfying. Oh, yeah. yeah That's like, almost in the great category. Yeah, it does feel good to control. Like, the, the, the room to room movement is, is superb. Yeah, the other uh, room transitions are good. That's something that we, we think about a lot because we're, we, we're developing a Metroidvania and we analyze that when we're playing Metroidvanias, we think about it a lot. How, how 
does the transitions from room to room work? How does how are the fade outs? How exactly where is the player positioned when you when you change rooms? Especially the bottom to top transitions. Those are different in different Metroidvania. And there's all kinds of different ways to handle such a thing, and it's something that a lot of people don't think about at all. You kind of just take it for granted. You're just moving through from room to room. But when you're designing a game, you really have to think about how is the player going to move from room to room seamlessly and still be engrossed in the game. And this game handles it well. Something else that I was um impressed with and also slightly confused was the the control scheme itself uh how how it was sort of a, a mix of japanese and english control schemes how like the circle button would be the confirm in japan right but x in america would be the confirm button yeah. and triangle was the back button and not only that but the shoulder the yeah the uh, l1 r1 and r2 were used for different transformations right and and, and that is a little confusing because None of those buttons is inherently linked to, say, the wolf or mist form. You just have to kind of memorize where they are. Like it's 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 not very elegantly done, I should say. The fact that yeah, uh, compared shoulder to buttons are just not yeah, so arbitrarily much. chosen for each transformation. Yeah, you just have to, yeah, you just have to memorize which shoulder button is which transformation, essentially. Uh, and, I, and I think they improved on that in in later iterations, especially with like the soul system in Dawn of Sorrow. I think that uh, probably because you know the, the lack of buttons also, also had something to do with it. But again, the face buttons, no major problems there. It controls just fine. So uh, yeah, the, the music overall is pretty solid. I would still put it. Yeah. I would definitely put it firmly in the good category. For sure. But I would say that. Um, I would say that earlier entries in the series were overall had overall had better soundtracks. But that's just some subjective taste. So yeah. we'll I, leave that. We'll leave that up to you guys. Leave it in the comments what you think. I know we did. We talk over most of the game, so we didn't always hear all the music. But I think we heard a little bit of at least a little bit of each section. Sure. Including um, what was it called? The abandoned catacombs. Do, do. Da -na, da -na, yeah, that one. Da -na. Yeah, it's just it's basically just two notes on a piano. But so, so yeah, that's that's. But it's thematic. It's atmospheric. Yeah. Right. But I like I like the more melodic tunes from the older games. Um, another good thing about the game, this is almost in the great category, the atmosphere of the beginning, the way that the game is set up after the, uh, well, even, I think even the, uh, the bat, the Richter versus Dracula battle, I think the way that the storyline is set up besides the voice acting mm -hmm. is pretty solid. I think it's, I think it's really cool. And it was a very, uh, it was an ambitious and bold way of opening a game back then to start you playing as a different character telling the prequel to what's about to happen. And um, once you gain control of Alucard and you run it lightning speed into the into the castle, and it's playing the the uh, it's playing bloody is it playing bloody tears or is it playing some it's playing another guitar song was it bloody I don't think it's bloody I don't tears remember. no yeah. I don't think it plays bloody tears when you go in but it's playing it's playing a uh, a tune that is a high energy tune right and uh, and you get your power stolen by death so you get a you get a chance to experience. Um, some of the uh, higher power moves early, if you, well, I guess if you know how to execute them. But anyway, it's just, it's very atmospheric when you're first entering uh, the castle and the prequel to that, the Richter versus Dracula fight. I think the, the way that it's set up is pretty awesome. Um, on a lower note, on a somewhat lesser note in the good category, the the hit point ups, they feel good. To, it feels good to pick one up. <laughs> That's and about it. There are a ton of them. There's a ton of them. And yeah. as usual in Metroidvania, they feel great to pick up. And this is one of the earlier games to really nail the design and the, the placement and the number of them that you get so that it feels uh, it feels good to get them. I, you know, I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if this is the, the case for all Castlevania games, but we ended the game with like 700 HP. I don't think that number i don't think the the number inflation is that high in other in subsequent games i feel like that's yeah, ridiculous I don't, I don't know maybe especially considering that most consumables restored 10 to 20 hp yeah yeah which is another thing that's kind of a bad that's in the bad category but yeah, yeah I, i'm yeah let's just cross that off then yeah like, I, just well, consider that in the bad category sure. that the consumables take up that they don't heal for very much hp most of them most of the the consumable health restoring items are pretty worthless like now i'm considering like what was the max hp in dawn of sorrow or portrait of ruin i, I can't quite remember yeah, but i can't either i would be very surprised if it was as high as, as we ended up being and when we weren't even grinding you know yeah. we, this was just we didn't even see everything the game had to offer and we were just kind of like you know so the, the balance is off the balance is well that's actually in the bad category i might even put it in terrible oh i did actually uh the balance ranges from good to terrible and we can come back to it at some point 
Um, That's probably so, the, yeah. Yeah, another thing in the good category, there's a lot of unique items, a lot of unique weapons. Oh, yeah. Um, the weapons, I mean, a lot of them are just swords that just attack directly, so the weapons let in less of a category. But this is a game where a lot of the enemies that you see throughout all the GBA and the DS Castlevania games make their first appearance, and they reuse the same sprites in the, in the games subsequently. Konami and Capcom have that in common. They like to reuse artwork and assets, which nothing really against them for doing that. Yeah, the and fact that those those sprites have survived many many decades. Yeah, the, use, you know? the artwork is yeah the artwork's obviously really good. Like the yeah. the artists that they have the artists that they did have at Konami doing the sprite artwork in that time were amazing. I mean the artwork still holds up today, easily. There's really yeah no question about that. Um, so that's in the good category. Um, so this one Ed might be surprised that I have this one in the good category, but the random drop rates of items add to the charm of the game. I am surprised uh, to hear you say that. It's is the, I, that, I'm gonna allow it. I'm okay. gonna allow it in this game. Okay. Because the game has such a level of charm and such a level of surprise every time you play it, that there are some enemies that might have a one, two, five percent drop rate, something like that. An enemy that you're gonna kill maybe ten of each time you play through the game, and it it, it can drop something different every time you play the game. So I I think that in a game like this, I think that's I think that's gonna be in the good category, where you can get a different item from an enemy that you've never seen it drop before. And it can be something weird, like peanuts, for instance, which we'll talk about later. But well, maybe enemies don't drop peanuts, but so that might be a bad example as far as the, the drop rate goes. But you're going to see some different weapons or items depending on, yeah, each play through the game, you're certainly going to see enemies mm -hmm. drop different random items than you would have in uh, your, your previous playthroughs. This is one of those things that I'm, I'm actually quite glad that the, uh, Dark Souls has the same formula. Believe it or not, there are many enemies that have like a 1% drop rate on certain weapons and items. Things that you you only acquire through word of mouth from other people, you know? Almost nobody will find it. Like the Baldur Straight Sword in Dark Souls 1, you're never going to find it. It's from an early game enemy, but I think the drop rate is like 1 or 2%. And same with this game. Like, who would know to kill a shmoo? Nobody. Yeah, yeah the thing I'm curious about is, does that, does that uh, dissuade speedrunners from playing the game? Uh, I like, think, for instance, if you're able to get on the first shmoo that you kill on your playthrough, if you go directly to the the, the library in the second part of the game mm -hmm. where the shmoo first appears and you can manage to guarantee a drop of the best weapon in the game from the enemy that drops it at a 1% rate, if you can guarantee that drop, isn't it going to make the run go a lot faster and isn't it going to give you a significant advantage if you're the speedrunner that gets that run? Is, yeah. Does that make it, does that make the game less or more attractive for speedrunners? That's a good question. I know, like, it, it would reduce the theoretical uh, minimum time to such a degree that it would be impossible. Like, it would never be accomplished because no human out there is going to get that to drop the first time, right. as well as all the other all R the other RG factors. That, yeah. But it does create an interesting uh, goalpost. You know, it creates a, a hard and fast like if your time is an hour and you know the what they call the sum of best, right, is 30 minutes. It gives you something to shoot for if you're, a, you know, that kind of speedrunner who loves to do that kind of thing over and over and over. So sure, but to answer your question, I don't know if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I think randomness is inherently bad for speedrunning for obvious reasons. Right. Uh, but it might just depend on the person uh, or the category or the game. Uh, we, we didn't look up beforehand any sort of speedrunning for this, but I would bet, I would bet it's pretty competitive. Uh, yeah, I'd have to imagine. I mean, it's a it's a it's a classic. So a lot of the classics do get a mm -hmm. large speedrunning community. But if you're developing a new game and you make it have a very low drop rate for a weapon, that's going to very drastically increase the the uh, the rate at which you can complete the game. Is that going to break it and turn speedrunners away? I, th I think it probably would. <laughs> I, no, I think I think what people do is, instead is they go for the sure thing. Uh, like, for example, in Dark Souls, right, near the beginning of the game, there's a Black Knight Halberd you can get from Black Knight. I think it drops at a 30% rate, or 20%, or a 15% rate. And so most speedruns don't use that weapon at all, because they know it's too unreliable. So, what some Symphony of the Night players probably do is they just ignore the Chris Hagram altogether. And right. they just go for the second best thing. Alucard Sword, which you can get every time, because right. it's just in a certain Guaranteed. Point. It might just be going for Alucard Sword. I don't know. Requires no farming. You know, it fits in very well with the, the not necessarily sequence breaking, but the, the just the completely beelined patterns that, you know, most, most people will have running through this kind of game. So anything else good that you want to go over? Uh, let me see. Uh, actually, no. All I had in the good category was map design, uh, even though it's a little bit convoluted. So it's, it's a good with a little bit of bad. Okay, so let's go into bad. Okay. What's the first bad thing you got? <laughs> um, 
I don't know if this is necessarily a point against it, but it's hindsight. Hindsight is the bad thing. It's impossible for us to critically analyze and and logically understand the impact that this came. Well, not n not for us, for me. Yeah, uh, maybe for Ed in the year yeah. 2021. So, like for example, my example here was that after the Matrix came out, every film that that came out for the next five years was parodying the Matrix. And after Ocarina of Time came out, there were plenty of other games that were very similar in gameplay. And it, it muddies the water so that you don't understand, and Evangelion as well. Uh, people said that that's revolutionary. And I watched it. When I watched it, I thought there was very little about it that, that stuck out to me. But I understand that when it came out, it was revolutionary in some aspects. But these things are, these things are diminished by the games that come after. Uh, and I found myself constantly comparing this game to Dawn of Sorrow, Portrait of Ruin, because I think even though those games were less revolutionary for their time, they did the thing that this game did better, you know, which is understandable. Probably from an objective standpoint, except for one thing, which we're going to go out and we're going to go over in the great category. But I think, mm -hmm. yeah, besides the one thing that we're going to go over in the, the great category, that this game stands tall above all subsequent Castlevania releases. Is the boobs and the dicks, right? Is, um... You made me lose my train of thought here. In the statues, they got boobs. Is um, is the charm. You're going to say the charm. Yeah, well, the charm, yeah, obviously, the, the charm stands above, but there's something specific that stands above the other games. Yeah, the other games are objectively better. The peanut. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. The, the other games are, are objectively better, but I have a, a nostalgia for Castlevania Symphony sure. of the Night, because this was my first Castlevania Metroidvania. It was the first one that mm -hmm. came out, and it was my personal first Castlevania Metroidvania. So I'm going to look at it through a nostalgia lens. Plus, it's also still a pretty solid game. It's still like, on my list of probably, I mean, of top Metroidvanias that a person should play. This might be number one. Yeah. Like As far as if yeah. you should play, if you're only going to play one Metroidvania, this is probably the one. But if you're going to try to develop a Metroidvania, for instance, and you've never played a Metroidvania before, there's there's no one in existence that exists that is this guy. But there's probably like uh, there's probably like a top ten list that you would put. But Symphony of the Night would certainly be on any top ten list, and I would probably put it as number one. But again, people play it. People will recommend that. You would recommend that because it was revolutionary in 1997. It is no longer revolutionary, and if you want to get a better experience for the same genre, you would play Dawn of Sorrow. Am I wrong? Um, yeah, I mean, Dawn of Sorrow, prob probably Dawn of Sorrow is objectively the best of the Metroidvania Castlevania games, yeah. Like, playing in the year 2021, you don't get the, the feelings that you got when you played this game in 1997. I mean, I do. Oh, you do, okay, but, right. But for, for a first timer, I But for a first timer, yeah. I, I still think that I still think the Castlevania Symphony of the Night, if I'm gonna pick one Castlevania Metroidvania, I, I'm still gonna stick with Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the reasons that we're gonna talk about towards the end of okay. the video. But, um, so we're in the bad category still, right? Uh, so yeah. So yours was hindsight. Right, yeah. yeah. And that's not really a point against it, but let's see. Um, I would say the balance is pretty bad. Bordering on terrible, but bad. Uh, firmly in the bad category. I would agree with that. I didn't put it on my list, but I, I think I would agree with that yeah. overall. A lot of the things, and of course, you know, it's it's hard to hold them accountable for it because they were breaking new ground all yeah, over this the place. Is, this is an... This is a very early game in a genre like this. Back then, yeah. leveling up was not seen in platformers. I can't think yeah. of a platformer before this game, actually, that had leveling up. Very few games that even had an action element to them yeah. had leveling up systems. Back then, leveling up was strictly for turn-based game RPGs with turn-based battle systems. That was the only place where you saw leveling up at all, up until 97. Casimir and Symphony of the Night was, was a very unique and a very bold move in that in a in a different direction for that time. I'm not saying it's it might not be the first, and it's probably not the the only from the only game from 1997, maybe even before that had done something in the action genre. But I'm saying there was very few, if any, that had done it before Castlevania Symphony of the Night. So it's kind of a good thing that level ups don't really matter that much in this game for that reason. You know, it doesn't really give you an incentive to grind. You don't really feel your levels making a difference. But it's yeah, just a nice the, extra the, system. The weapons make the weapons are going to make the most difference, particularly yeah. uh, the Grisagrim, which we're obviously going to go over and, in this review here. And the Ring of Twenty Four Burly Men. Uh, the, right. Uh, another bad thing about the game: getting juggled. Uh, it can be yep. kind of annoying getting yep. juggled in the game. I actually put this under terrible. Okay. Well, we'll yeah. cover it in terrible then. Um. So another bad thing: the old style 3D. It's I, I find it to be kind of charming oh, and, like and nostalgic. It. I like yeah, it. Yeah, but I was going to put it just kind of objectively, I guess, in the bad category. The, uh, yeah. the 3D castle that they show in the beginning and some of the 3D effects during the game. The the 2D artwork is obviously beautiful. It's about as good as pixel art gets. And people, like, yeah, even now, people emulate, 
even though we don't need to use pixel art in games, people still use pixel art because people just really love the style. And this game, I mean, it has masterful pixel art, but the 3D, especially in-game, sort of gets, sort of takes away from it. But it can also be kind of charming. It's it's a relic of the, of the time that it's from. So I have some nostalgia for it, but I think objectively it kind of looks weak. Yeah, it could be a little jarring, I think, but I, I actually remember um, a lot of the 3D effects in certain areas, like the lava effects or the, the cloud effects, they were so 3D. They were just like, they had three dimensions, but it was as if they were coming out of the screen towards you. And I think yeah, they, yeah. it felt like they made an extra effort to capitalize on the the very rare occasions where they could make extra use of 3D, even though it was a 2D game. Any Anywhere that it was possible to have something coming at you, they made extra sure that it looked good. And I, I thought those parts, they pulled it off very well. You had that in the bad court category, right? I, yeah, objectively, I, I'd say yeah, it's bad, but that's fair. nostalgia, I would, I'd say, I still I still appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to speak about graphical fidelity uh, um, after all this time. Oh, as far as balance goes, just to add to the mm -hmm. previous balance conversation, Soul Steel, it's, it's too good. It is it's too good. It's way too good. Like, a yeah. lot of the command attacks are way too good. We'll go over the commands a little bit more later, the, the negative side of them later. But um, uh, another thing that's a little awkward is the backdashing as, mm -hmm. as movement. It's the backdashing, I mean, it, it's in there so that it's to be used as a dodge, yeah. more or less, from enemy attacks, but it's actually mostly just used to move faster. It just needs a cooldown. So, yeah, know? yeah, it could, it could use a cooldown or, yeah, probably just a cooldown would fix it. So you can just, it would, yeah, it could still look a little awkward, but I think that would fix most of it if it had a cooldown on it. But the, the backdashing, yeah, you can just keep on mashing the triangle button and just continue backdashing. All you gotta do is face away <laughs> from the direction you wanna go and mash triangle and you move faster. So it's sort of like Ocarina of Time where rolling is the fastest yeah. way of movement, but it looks stupid. Yeah. Like you want your game to look cool and look pretty and beautiful while you're playing it, but it kind of takes away from the game if the main character is just rolling everywhere or backdashing everywhere instead of running or walking or whatever the the method of locomotion that your character has is. So, you know, <laughs> speaking of Ocarina of Time, I believe the fastest way to traverse Hyrule Field is to actually Z target and run backwards. Oh. You're quick stepping backwards? Like the, I, the back flip? Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe the back flip or just like, because for some reason I guess you gain a lot more speed when you're when you're backing away from something. So it's almost the same as uh, as the back dash in this game, for, for whatever reason. And like that's a that's a rough trap to fall in because you've you've put yourself into a corner, you've put yourself into a position where your players are going to do the thing that you don't want them to do. Yeah, the, the way that yeah, I think it's really up to the developers to figure it out because the players are going to figure out the fastest method of locomotion, especially the speedrunners and the hardcore players. They're gonna figure they're gonna figure it out and they're gonna make your game look look stupider than it needs to. So we're keeping that in mind uh, as we develop our our current game. So the mo the most efficient method of locomotion in your game should be something that that looks natural at the very least or yeah looks cool at best yeah yeah um, like skipping in real life it's the most efficient form of locomotion it's fun as hell yeah i do that i, I do that sometimes you can't do it out well you can do it outside if you don't care yeah but it's so fun i'll I'm, just i'll do it in the parking lot to the store yeah that's usually when i'll do it that's usually about the only time i would do it at night probably it's weird seeing a guy who's bald with facial hair skipping I don't want people to yeah, get the wrong Yeah, it's weird seeing an adult man do it, but you know, they see me. It's worth Whatever. It. If you haven't skipped in a while, take this time to go outside it, and skip It does today. fill you with joy. It does. Skipping for 10 seconds will fill you with joy. Just try it if you're in a parking lot somewhere, or but really anywhere. You could do it on a trail or outside. Yeah, more endorphins. Just go outside right now and do it. More endorphins than having a baby. I'm not sure about that. Oh. So, uh, the, another thing that's bad mm -hmm. about the game, I would say, this is only slightly bad, but the summon system encourages not experimenting with the different kinds of summons because once you've gained six to ten levels on one, exp on yeah. one uh, well, they're called familiars, on one familiar, you're sort of discouraged from testing out others. So, maybe in subsequent playthroughs you'll do it. So, there's an argument to be made for that being okay. It's not really a big bad thing, but I thought I would just add that. Yeah. I, that mechanic mechanic. That mechanic is is pervasive. Like for example in Oblivion, right? Uh, Elder Scrolls 4, that was the thing that happened. Um, well, I guess in all of them, really, all the Elder Scrolls games, the more you use a skill, the more it levels up and the ones that you don't use are just get neglected. Same with I think Final Fantasy 2 had the same system where if you used a sword, you got better in sword play. Oh, it's it's a fundamentally flawed system if you are the kind of person who likes to stick with one thing. But if you're not, if you like to experiment and you get joy out of leveling something else. Uh, I feel like it's a double-edged sword, and I don't mind it, but I do understand 
uh, the detractors. Yeah. I'm actually okay with that because it would be, I would be the kind of person who would start like New Game Plus or who would start a new game and just only use another familiar just to see what it was like. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could be good or bad, but I just thought it was uh, worthy of mentioning. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have anything else bad or should we go into terrible? Um, the, so this is again only in hindsight. Using consumables from the menu is kind of awkward uh, because the, the last thing you want to do, like for example, when you play Skyrim, the last thing you want to do is have the player open his menu, open the open the item menu, and eat 13 cheese wheels during combat, yeah. and then resume combat. You do have to throw the items on the ground and then pick them up. Yeah. This is another bad thing, That's... actually. When you equip a food item, you... Okay, so I... in order to grab a food item, oh. you grab it off the ground when you first encounter that food item. You grab it off the ground, it adds it to your inventory. Then you go into your inventory by pressing start, going to the menu, and then you equip the weapon on your right hand. Then you go back into the game, you use the item using your right hand by pressing the circle button, which throws the item back, back onto on the ground. ground. And now this time when you pick it up, you gain whatever amount of life that the item healed, which is usually like 19 hit points, which is almost nothing. Yeah, it seems like they didn't really have a, an exit strategy for how that mechanic was going to work. So they just, they made it work with what they had, this, the, the mechanics that they had. Like, they didn't have a system for using items from the menu, which is Im implemented in later games. And... Even though it still sucks that you can go into the menu and just eat as much cheese wheels as you can, it's much better than having it's, to, it's like... It's cleaner, at least. It's cleaner than having to equip the item, go back out to the game, you know, resume the, the pace of the combat, throw the item on the ground, and then just do that over and over. It's... it's it, it sees an improvement in later series, but it's still pretty bad. It's, it, it's not intuitive or... Uh, challenging at all. Also in the slightly bad category, the menu, the pause menu was unfinished <laughs> in the game yeah. because they had to push the game out too fast. I actually didn't know that and it wouldn't have bothered me if I hadn't known that. It still doesn't really bother me all that much. It's only slightly bad. Uh, anything else in bad? That's all I got for bad. Uh, is, is next terrible? Next is terrible. Okay. Go ahead, you go first. Uh, okay, so uh, these things could have been in bad, but they are just extra bad. For example, the translation, which is to be expected, right? The translation... The, the UI, again, as we were talking about, there's too much information is obscured from you, probably out of necessity because you can only fit so many words on a, on a screen. On your, Like, the PlayStation resolution was like 300 by 200 or you know, something ridiculous, ridiculously small. You can't really fit that much information on screens uh, back in 1997. Um, as well as things that force you, like getting stoned by Medusas, uh, getting stun locked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's getting the Medusas. Yeah. Especially the stoning Medusas. I'm yeah. glad that you added that because I forgot to put that down. Yeah. yeah. Awful. Awful. I, I Those think... fucking yellow Medusas. And they keep fucking putting them in. They kept putting them in the games even after this one. Yeah. Terrible. I th Terrible. I, th I think the enemy combinations uh, in tandem with certain environments. Like it's it's in particular the clock tower where your goal is to traverse a a, a perilous series of jumps. Right. If it wasn't so perilous. These very, very tight jumps you have and to make. And there's also spikes and there's Medusas. That, that, yeah. that nearly kill you when you touch them. <laughs> that they can get yeah. knocked into. It's yeah, it's just murderous. Like, like the rest of the, there's nothing else in the game that's that difficult to traverse. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you're getting frozen in place by enemies that come off the side of the screen suddenly. Even when you're even yeah. sometimes when you're standing close to the edge of the screen, I think there is some kind of a a limiter in there where if you're standing way too close to the edge of the screen, the Medusas may not continue to spawn. But anyway, regardless, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it feels I mean, it feels really bad. The clock tower, always a dreaded portion of Castlevania Symphony Night. You could pick any episode in this Let's Play and hear the frustration in my voice at some point as I get stunlocked. Now, granted, I'm not a great player, but the fact that it's it's this up and this down, this high and this low. The highs are so high, the lows are rock bottom. So it's it's inconsistent in many ways. You know, but at the same time, you could look at that as a positive. You could say it's much more realistic. It's much more uh, exciting when you hit those high highs, and it's much more distressing when you hit the low lows. That's up to the the individual, I suppose. But to me, not great. No, fuck, fuck the Medusas. Fuck the yellow Medusas. Yeah, in Medusas particular. in particular, the ones that stun you. And then once you're already stoned and they touch you again, we were taking like 35 damage. Yeah, they do it's a lot of damage. It's unreasonable. Yeah, the 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 attack itself does not in any way reflect the amount of damage that you take from the attack. You know, it doesn't look powerful, but you get wrecked. So, uh, that was my one terrible. The other terrible I have, unless you have one that you would like to talk about, is Chris Hager. Okay, let's, uh, well, we can do that. Yeah, go ahead, you just mentioned it. So, what's it, what about it? Uh, it's terrible. Okay, go ahead. It destroys the game, removes any semblance of challenge, uh -huh. uh, forces you to beeline only for that. It's, it's as if there was a god mode in the game. Nobody who plays a game wants to... You play a game to follow rules, to stay within the confines of rules, and reach a win condition. 
Nobody wants to just have uh, a get out of jail free card reach the win condition without any work. It's the same reason why when you use a game shark to give yourself all the guns and all the cars in Grand Theft Auto, you don't play the game after that anymore because you've done all the fun stuff there is to do. Yeah. Uh, and it's for the same reason, if, like in most games, if you cheat and give yourself level 99, all items, all abilities, it's not fun anymore because you've removed the only thing from the game that was keeping you playing, which is the the getting better and keeping the challenge together. So Chris Agram, yeah, it trivializes the game in a bad way. I think they could have they could have attempted to balance it. It feels like they didn't even try. It feels like nobody even knew it was in there except for the one dev that put it in. Chris Agram is, uh, if you didn't watch our LP or if you're not familiar with it, it's the best weapon in the game by far. Maybe the best weapon in any game of all time by far. Oh, it's, yeah. a, it's basically a god weapon. And um, I'm going to offer my rebuttal to Ed's argument in the great section. Wow. Okay. Um, so on my list of terrible, we'll go over one of mine. It's uh, in the inputs for Soul Steel particularly. But the inputs in general, they're really, really picky. You have to enter them slowly and very accurately. And they're, they're Street Fighter style inputs in this game, which isn't that surprising because the game was released in the mid to late 90s, which is right on the heels of the Street Fighter craze and the fighting game craze where quarter circle forward attack was everything. Or, and um, Soul Steel, though, in particular, you have to press back, quarter circle back, forward attack and it has to be entered in a very precise way while there's enemies and projectiles coming at you yeah. and it's it's really unforgiving and you have to enter it slowly in order for it to to register and it's it can be pretty frustrating is it fair to say that like the games that use those commands that this game takes inspiration from like street fighter 2 that those commands are easier to pull off in those games they're absolutely easier to so, pull off they have yeah. forgiveness built yeah. in you can enter them as fast or as slow as you want there's uh, there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of leniency and they're much smoother it's uh, and they're in a game that's i mean it's a completely different genre it's a game where you're always facing your opponent so you always know which direction that you're facing which direction you're going to be doing the command in and there's so many reasons why it works great in mm -hmm. a 2D fighting game and why it continues to be used today in 2D fighting games, why those commands continue to be used. There's, I mean, we're not going to get into fighting games, but the, uh, there's a good reason why a lot of fighting games still use those. And it's not necessary that they have to use those, but there's a reason why a lot of fighting games still use those. And, they, and, a lot of, and there's a reason why they're not, anymore, they're not any longer used in platformers. And Symphony of the Night, mm -hmm. they experimented with it. I appreciate and applaud the effort, the experimentation with using the command attacks in uh, in a 2D platformer in a Metroidvania, but it just doesn't work. And they, it's actually, and on top of that, the way that the uh, the control is programmed is uh, way too picky for the, yeah, yeah. It's just it's just way too picky, and it's diff it's they're difficult to execute. And on top of that, not only are they difficult to execute, execute, but they're too good. If they're you also, could do Soul Steel? Yeah, they're also overpowered. Mainly yeah. Soul Steel is overpowered. The other ones we hardly used even yeah. in our in our playthrough. The other ones are, are good, but Soul Steel, really, once you know how to do Soul Steel, that's that's the only one you really need to use. Yeah. So it sort of eliminates the usefulness of all the other ones. And they programmed all that stuff into the game. There's animations for everything. They look fucking cool. I just wish that they were um, had either a, they they should just have a higher mana cost and have a simple input. Like, for instance, hold R2, press triangle to do soul steal. Hold yeah. R2, press square to do the fireball attack, for instance. Because those are things you could use uh, in the heat of the moment, you know, in a pinch. Right, yeah. But you cannot you just press do, two buttons at once. Yes, you can which, never do soul steal in a pinch unless you got extremely lucky. Leading into that, there are two button abilities in the game, the shield rod abilities. Right. This is in the bad category, however, because oh. the shield rod uh, there's no indication of how to do the shield rod abilities in the game. Mm -hmm. The shield rod, well, let's just introduce shield rod. Shield rod is an item in the game. It's just a, it's a normal weapon that you strike enemies with, except for the fact that if you equip a shield onto your second hand, and then you press the attack button plus your second hand button, which is where the shield is, it does a unique attack for each shield in the game. And I think there's 12 shields in the game. I might be wrong. It's around that, though. And for each shield, it uses a different fucking attack. It's amazing. The amount yeah. of detail that they put into this, I mean, this is in the great category. We're getting in the great category uh, as, far as, as far as that goes, but... The, uh, the shield rod, it's one of the greatest items in the game, one of the greatest items in the history of games. And each time, yeah, it uses a different animation. It shows you a different summon every time you press the attack button plus whatever unique shield that you have equipped. It's, it just, it, it adds so much to the game and I wish that they would indicate that blatantly somewhere. Like when you pick up shield rod, I know you don't necessarily wanna give them a big text explanation of 
this is what this item does. You just pick this up, it's really fucking special. But if in the middle of Cast Me Innocent for the Night, if there was nothing else in the game like this, if when you picked up Shield Rod, it said, if you have this weapon equipped with a shield and you press both those buttons at once, mm -hmm. something really fucking cool is gonna happen. <laughs> Yeah. I, I would forgive that. I think that would be great because it's such a waste of all their effort to make yeah. all this artwork and all this animation and all these abilities, all this effort that they put into this item, and then to have most players never experience it because they can't figure out that if they press attack and shield at the same time, it's going to do something special. Part of that problem, wasn't it uh, triangle and shield? It was triangle and circle, right, on the PlayStation controller? Uh, it would be square it, and circle. They're are opposite from each other. Oh, it was? I thought yeah. it was triangle and circle for no, some No, it's not triangle okay, and okay, circle. Okay, good. Triangle I was going to say. Backdash. Yeah, I, I knew it was backdash. I, for some reason, I remember those being the buttons. But okay. Uh, uh, I pretend I never said anything then. What else is bad in the game? Or what else is terrible in the game? The voice acting. There's really nothing else to be said about it. It's yeah. so terrible that it's funny and great and we love it. Yeah, but, it's, I mean, you know. Resident, Evil, Resident Evil came out in, what, 96? So... There, nothing needs to be said, I think. Uh, one more one more thing on my terrible list. Okay. Uh, there's some obtuse solutions, particularly the uh, what you need to do in order to get the clock tower to activate in the first oh. half of the game, uh, where you need to get the gold and the silver ring, and oh, you need to yeah. wear in the clock tower. The only right. indication is where dot 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 clock dot dot dot, and then the other, in, that's the description of the gold ring. And right. then the description of the silver ring is like where dot 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 tower dot dot dot, or something, yeah. something like that. <laughs> And then if you look at all the items in your inventory and you notice that the gold and the silver ring form a sentence that says, wear these items in the clock tower or something like that, then you go to the clock tower while re wearing the gold and the silver ring and you know it. But you might just be lost wandering around the castle because the rest of the game is built around wandering around the castle and eventually you come along the solution. But in this case, you actually had to look in your inventory and figure out that the gold and the silver ring are to be worn in the clock tower. And this is the only way that you can progress the game. You need to use, you need to use a, a wiki page or game facts or a guide of some kind in order to figure this out. Yeah, that's a very 90s thing to do, I think. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's obviously terrible and it would be completely unacceptable in a modern game. Uh, but if you know how to do this, the game can continue on and then uh, you're, you're fine. But don't go into the game blind because you need to know, you need to know this one thing. It sucks, but you need to know where the gold and silver ring in the clock tower. Sorry, you it's know, terrible. What else is interesting about that is, is I believe uh, most of the subsequent Castlevania games that I've played follow a similar, okay, do you remember the fight with, um, who's the fight with where you have to break that little blue, uh, green ball? It's, is it Richter that you fight in this game? In you have to break the green ball. Not sure. Um, you, you know, you, uh, every, every Castlevania game has that 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 one fight where you get the bad ending if you just kill the guy. Oh, okay. Versus yeah. where you do the other thing. Like in Bonasaur, you have to equip a certain necklace before you kill a boss, right? Yeah. And in this game, that was that was the thing. You had to defeat the the, the floating green orb that was, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. But you had yeah. to equip the, uh, like the, it was like the cursed ring or something to let you see through illusions. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you that's a thing. That too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's a thing that is unacceptable. However, it is, it is uh, genre charm. Because it, it it basically accompanies every game in this genre to some extent. So even though it's kind of except like Bloodstained, for God's sake, Bloodstained did it. You had to attack the moon. That's right. Yeah, that was a confusing part of the game. I yeah. think I remember being stuck at that part. So again, it's one there of those... was the one boss where you didn't yeah. have to attack the boss. You had to attack the moon in the background. And it's not really clear that you're coming up against the end of the game unless you have this item equipped. So like, it's it's not really uh, foreshadowed in any way. You kind of just stumble into it, get the bad ending. And you're like, well, now what? So same thing with that clock tower. It's a little bit, like you said, it's a little bit game faxy. It's a little bit 90s-y. But what do you expect? Yeah, you know? it's, it's a product of the era. Yeah. It's, just, it's kind of unfortunate. But yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But that's that's just how it was. Um, so are we done with terrible? Anything else in terrible? Uh, that's it for me. All right, we're going to go into great then. So let's start with the biggest thing. My my most favorite thing about Casamania Symphony of the Night. It's the charm. Just yep, in same, general, the same. charm. That's the biggest thing as far as great goes. Anyway, I'll let, I'll let you go first on it then. Oh, I mean, I mean, all these things that you primed me for, such as the peanut and the, yep, uh, the yep. confessional and the fact that we discovered something new in the confessional. You know, if you go on the other side. Right, right. Okay, you know? I was gonna, I was actually going to mention that too. Yeah, as yeah. far as the charm goes, yeah, just the unique situations that you can get into. I think, yeah, that's a prime example that I always point to, although there are dozens of them in the game, where, yeah, you go into the confessional in the cathedral area, you sit down at the confessional, nothing happens. But if you wait, the priest will stab you. <laughs> and yeah, we discovered yeah. this time, you sit in the priest's, in the priest's seat, you get stabbed anyway. <laughs> So yeah, I mean there are very few games that, that are willing to take this this amount of effort to create things that they're pretty sure that nobody will see. Right. It, very it, few it required a lot of additional assets and additional yeah. programming in order to put that into the game. So that's it's a lot of effort to just add something I call charm. And it's something that 
a lot of games do not take the time to do. Current games are much more utilitarian yeah. than a lot of these older games. I think there's players feel like they maybe maybe not necessarily than the players. Maybe it's more or less maybe it's more the developers than the players. But people feel like that the players should be rewarded for finding any kind of weird thing happening. They should be rewarded with experience or items or some kind of a some kind of a benefit to their character. But I have a, a philosophy that I believe that. I mean, it, not for every game, but I believe that a good solid number would be maybe 10% of areas in a game, 10% of dead ends in a game, or 10% of, just 10% of the game in general should be, uh, should be things that do not reward the player for anything besides just finding something that another player may not have found. Mm -hmm. Just odd occurrences or an item that really is not actually good but does something weird. There's there's innumerable examples. I'm not going to get into everything that you could possibly do in game design, but I think just yeah, adding charm to a game is something that a lot of modern developers don't do. It's more utilitarian uh, nowadays. Especially, but I mean, that's not to say there's some there's no, that, that games don't do it. But Castlevania Symphony Night just absolutely nails it. Like when I think of a game that has charm, this is the first one I think of. So I think we uh, I think we got that one. Um, as oh, I guess also on the category of charm, um, the demon and the familiars in general. The demon happens to be my favorite <laughs> the demon, one. The voice but, acting. Too. Yeah, the voice acting on the the familiars and especially the demon, but. I mean, the, the familiars are charming. It's an it's an addition to the game that actually really wasn't necessary uh, overall. They could have done it with just items, but they added these cute little characters that you can choose one of them to follow you around. It's sort of like having a, a Pokemon or a pet that follows you around, and it just adds to the charm of the game. And it's not overall unique to only mm -hmm. this game or only Castlevania, but it's I, I think it definitely adds to the charm. That's one of the most common things about this game is the fact that uh, many of the systems are completely optional and, uh, you know, were not required by the devs to be implemented, and yet they were. So I think that's where the charm comes from, the fact yeah, you, that there are familiars. You could just choose you know? not to use familiars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the devs could have just not built that system into the game at all, and it still right. would have been almost as good. But the fact that they took the time to do it knowing, right. knowing that the experience would be unique for each player because every player is going to choose a different familiar and go a different path. Like, they had, I think they had a lot of foresight in many ways you know uh, i think they were ahead of their time which is looking back kind of obvious in retrospect it's cheap of me to say that but there it is and yeah and the, the way that the peanuts are used in the game which we, we talked about we mentioned mm -hmm. peanuts right yeah. but the way that you have to consume the peanuts um well just watch our lp and you'll see us uh struggle to consume the peanuts yeah nothing and is just given to you there's an episode called yeah. peanuts actually if you want to see us struggle <laughs> to use the peanuts yeah but i i love that that's 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 actually probably the first thing the first thing i think of besides just the word charm when i think yeah. of castlevania symphony of the night is peanuts which is it's just an example of one of the many hidden little gems in the game and also i find the librarian to be uh to be in that category as well. I find his uh, his voice acting and the goofiness to be uh, a lot of fun, and that you can uh, that you can do the uh, the super jump underneath him yeah, and yeah. send him flying. Is that it? Just goofy little stuff like that I really will. makes the game just. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what dev came up with that idea. They were like, "Hey, it'll be really cool if we have a little opening in the wall here. We just have the player super jump into his butt." Yeah, it's it's funny. It is they, yeah. like you, you know they were probably like either a couple of developers were just hanging around in the in the uh, in the coffee room or something in the break room or maybe they had a meeting even and and somebody brought that up and they're like that's really funny we got to do it we got to do it yeah and that's like me and Ed are like that all the time we come up with all kinds of goofy ideas and we're not we're never gonna do most of them but you know throw a couple of those in though if you have like a crazy goofy idea I think it's gonna I think things like that make players remember your game more than including um, just really awesome, even really awesome art design or really cool weapons or, or a feeling of power or rewarding the player in a, in a way that is uh, Pavlovian in essence. Uh, um, really try, trying to nail that stuff down exactly and perfectly. I think the players remember the little things more now more than ever because there's so many games to choose from and especially for older guys who like, have played so many different games it's like just the little things tend to stick out more than the overall feel of the game or the overall um yeah it, even if the game yeah or the overall tightness of the design of the game um so yeah that's the charm that's probably the greatest thing about the game mm -hmm. um yeah 
Another thing that's great is the shock the shock point. Wait, I don't think we've actually technically spoiled it in this, so let's not do it now. But okay. um, there is a shocking revelation in the middle of this game. I would easily put in the top 10 most shocking revelations in the history of gaming. So if you haven't seen it, watch your LP or play the game. So I'm just going to put that in the great category. There's really not, not much else to be said about it without spoiling it. Yeah. Um, the exploration in the second half of the game mm -hmm. is amazing. After you get all the abilities and you're able to explore like on your own, um, you really don't have to worry about getting any more keys. You're, the game becomes really open-ended, and you really you, you get that you get that essence of you, that essence of movement, the power of movement through a Metroidvania. It feels really good, and it feels great to be able to just look at the map and know any open spot you can go, you can get there. That is nice. Yeah, so I really like that. I, that's that's a that's a design element that. I would uh, love to in incorporate, and we are incorporating in our uh, in our current Metroidvania that we're developing. And yeah, I, I that's there's nothing better in a Metroidvania than knowing you've got somewhere to go, even if you have to retraverse an old area. Just knowing that what you're doing is going to progress the game, and you're going to discover a new area or something new in the game. That's uh, it's perfect. And that notion by itself almost seems at odds with the genre, because the genre is known for backtracking and exploring and looking at the same walls over and over and trying to like trying to remember where you were supposed to go you know but at the same time being able to go anywhere in the castle it's a good feeling yeah you know? yeah I, I i like knowing where to go in a game which sometimes is at odds with the genre of metroidvania but i don't think it has to be right so in this game in the first half i would say you could be you could get lost but in the second half once you have everything it's 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 a lot harder to get lost and there's but there's still lots to do and there's a lot of play time left once you've got all the abilities. So, there's that. Um, another thing that's great is the shield rod, which we discussed earlier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we, I think we went into that enough. So, shield rod is in the great category. Um, another thing that I find to be great is Crusagrum. Ed put that in the terrible category. I find Crusagrum to... Now, while I actually pretty much agree with all of Ed's points, I'm not going to lie, it does... It does marginalize the difficulty of the rest of the game and I think that my personal experience with Chris Agram ha has colored my experience perfectly because I was able to play through the game the first time not knowing Chris Agram existed. Mm -hmm. so my first time through the game, I beat the game pretty much legit and it's a, it's a fairly hard game um, to get through uh, without um, yeah, just, as, yeah, just gameplay wise, it's a hard game to get through um, and control your way through without the god weapon of the Crusagrum. Uh, the Crusagrum is a weapon that attacks four times every time you press the button. You can mash the button almost as fast as you want. You can attack essentially 20 to 30 times per second, and it does heavy damage, and you can use it while moving. There's no, there's almost no limitation to it, just to give a brief description of yeah. what it does. It's and a god weapon. It's unbelievably powerful. Like, any of those characteristics would have still been overpowered. Whether it attacked four times a second, whether yeah. you could use it while moving, any, any one of those things would have been amazing. And it just happens. Yeah. That they it also all... has incredible reach. Oh. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. Jesus. But so. Um, so my first time through the game, though, I didn't have it, and I had to play through the game legitimately. The second time, I got it by chance. I had from a shmoo. The guide. I got it from a shmoo by chance. I picked up the weapon wow. for Sagram. I was like, oh, I got a, I got a weapon. I equipped it, and I was completely blown away. I think I probably had the perfect experience. Probably what the yeah. developers were imagining that a player would experience without yeah. looking at a guide getting this new weapon and just being absolutely blown away that they discovered essentially like a god code for the game. They were playing the long game in that case. They knew you were going to play through again and, and it, find that weapon. It was one of, yeah, I mean, it was it was a wonderful gaming experience mm -hmm. for me in my very younger year, my very much younger years of, of playing video games. And I, uh, I appreciated that they put it in the game. So I may be looking at it with rose-colored glasses, but... My experience with Crusagrim was was that, and then every other time I've played through the game, this has been my sixth time through the game, uh, wow. I've gotten Crusagrim. And I love the feel of using the weapon, and I think if it was balanced to be not quite so powerful, would still feel pretty good, mm -hmm. feel good, like you can move while using it, and it has most of the same characteristics, just not, maybe just lower the damage, essentially, <laughs> would be what you would do probably yeah. to balance it. Uh, I, I just, yeah, I, th I think that the way that the, uh, the weapon is controlled is, is just great. You know, that's what yeah, they it's did pretty for... simple, but... Yeah. You know, Bloodstained, that's all they did, was they reduced the damage significantly, so that it becomes competitive with yeah, other they, weapons. That's, that's actually... Yeah, it's a good example. But it still has the reach, it still has the speed, and it still feels great to use. Yeah. So, another Igarashi game, you know, they, they came back and, and tried again, and 
I think it turned out better, even though it's more balanced and less crazy. Just as good. Yeah, I can see how that is a, both a terrible and a great in this game. So, really depends on your perspective. Wh while we disagree, we also pretty much agree on all points, I think. All the points that we both made, Ed yeah. made a bunch of terrible points that I agreed with, and I made some great points that Ed also agreed with, so. Yeah, it turns uh, out, uh, depending on how you look at any of these parts of the game, they can be terrible, great, good, you know, they fit into a lot of categories. Which is, again, like, I feel it kind of representative of this game. It's impossible to just boil it down to any particular thing. It's got the charm, it's got the new genre feel, it's got the, you know, the action, the backtracking, but also the stun locking, the terrible controls, the commands. There's yeah. a lot to it. I feel like it it hits every player differently, especially if you were playing it in 1997 versus 2021. There's just too much to go to go over, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it, I don't know. I thought it was fine. I thought it was fine, but it didn't blow me away in 2021. Maybe that's just me. But I know you played it in 19... Did you play it in 97? Did you, did you buy it like, uh, I don't think it was release? 90, I don't think it was 97. It was probably like 99 or something. So, so okay, it was, so, it was so pretty, pretty soon after. Yeah, it was this pretty was, close to the release, yeah. This was like the, the beginning of GameFAQ days, or right, or like right around yeah. that time-ish, yeah, when it wasn't much. so easy to just look up things Yeah, the dial-up days where, yeah, yeah, where only nerds knew what GameFAQ was. Yeah, and, I, and yeah. yeah, no one would be able to get through this game without knowing that, or just yeah. knowing knowing somebody, or having the magazine, or the walkthrough, or whatever. Like, I know it's a cop-out to say, oh, it was okay in 1997, because some things should just not be okay no matter what year they were made. You know, some mechanics should not be forgiven. Yeah, you don't necessarily need to forgive old games. I mean, we we uh, make a habit of playing old games on our Games We Never Played series, or on our Atari Games series, which is very old, and don't go back and watch those, by the way. Uh, we make a habit of making fun of old games, and we uh, pretend that they were developed. We almost, yeah, we essentially <laughs> are just pretending that they were developed in modern times. Oh, we, yeah. We judge them as if they were developed in modern times, even if they were developed in 1981. But that's, yeah, you know, that's part of that's part of the charm of Game Soup. So do you have, about you have anything else great to say about Kazumi Symphony of the Night? Uh, the greatest thing I can say about it is that I liked it. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you liked it. Yeah, it's, I enjoyed my time thoroughly. I would be surprised if you didn't at least say that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, objectively, I can agree that there, yeah, there are some some things about it, and a lot uh, a lot of things about it that but, would not necessarily hold up. But right, but I no think, game is perfect. I think subjectively, even by modern standards, I would think that somebody playing it for the first time today would still find some enjoyment enjoyment with it. And if you don't have time to play it yourself, you know, throw it on in the background and watch our LP of it. You know, uh, and there's a. Uh, so the last, the last great thing I'm going to say about it, it's a real quick one, uh, it's just a surprise factor. The game really never stops surprising you. Yeah. As, you're, as you're playing through it, you're going to see a lot of unique things, unique enemies, unique items, unique mechanics, just, it's almost non-stop. It's like every, at least every 10 minutes, you're seeing, some, you're seeing something crazy happening. It's paced it perfectly, actually perfectly. Even knowing that you're going to be backtracking, going through areas you've been through, and kind of like being lost here and there. It, like yeah, it's paced perfectly. The 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 slow roll of new enemies and new like Grand Falloon. Like, yeah, Legion, like, some of the bosses are just that absolutely incredible. And that's the first hits. That's you. The, first, the first appearance of Legion, and yeah. it it blew my mind when I first saw Legion. Yeah, it has the sense. Me of Me and scam, my friends called it you know? Giant Ball of Dead Bodies, <laughs> even though it's called I guess it's called Grand Falloon. Grand but, Falloon. Yeah, yeah. It, it it really it capitalizes on the 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 the, uh, the tight spaces and then opens up for a lot of the, like, remember the, the, the cathedral room with the giant uh, living sword that just kills you instantly, basically? Yeah, yeah. Like, the, there, are, there are set piece moments in this game, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a platform where you don't normally expect to see those. And I think that contrast is fantastic. I don't remember how I got on that topic just now, but... But, yeah, sorry, it's a surprise like, factor. That was it. Oh, surprise, yeah, so, surprise factor. Yep. Anything else about about the great category? Uh, and I think we're about to wrap it up. I, yeah, I think yeah, I think, I think think we've said... I, I said all I wanted to say. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the game. Well, well I did as well for my yeah. sixth time through the game. <laughs> and we hope that you enjoyed watching the LP. And if you didn't, you can go ahead back and watch the LP. It'll be... Maybe we'll just... You know, we'll put it here. We'll put it here as the end card. Look, there it is. Oh, is it there? What if it's not there? What if nobody it'll, remembers It'll be there, the, man. Okay, somebody it'll be there. Remember. There's going to be a playlist right there. All right. As the end screen. All right. We like you. <laughs>